on, let's give the Lord some praise, church. Come on now.
Because you made a way, God. Thank you, God. Can I get a witness in this Thank church you. today? Because you only stand in here because God made a way for you. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. I know I got a witness. I know I got a witness. Hallelujah. I know I got a witness. Great God. Great God. I know I got a witness of how good God is. Worship you, Jesus.
There's no one like God. Bless your name, God. He sits high and he looks low, yeah. Bless your name, God. He's in control of everything. Thank you, God. There's no love greater than our God, yes. And all nations will bow to you, Lord, yes. Holy is your name, holy is your name. Great and mighty are your works, Jesus. Lift him up, glory, glory. Come on, church. I want to hear it. Everybody in this room say glory. in its place let's give him one let's lift up the name of Jesus up in here I just need one witness to lift up a hand and just say thank you up in this place and give him glory you're worthy God you're worthy yes yes glory to the lamb hmm. what a powerful worship song because that's what our life is about. Come on. Once we understand the magnitude of God's love, once we understand the magnitude of God's love, the only appropriate response is to yield and say glory to the Lamb. 
I can't think of any other appropriate response. Anything else would be less than what God deserves. Do y'all agree with me in this place? Anything other than bowing down and giving glory to the Lamb. When I think about the time before Christ in my life when I was actually an enemy of the cross. You know, I used to be ashamed to admit that, but now I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say it. I was an enemy of the cross. But then someone told me about the love of Jesus. And they told me that he loved me so much that he gave his only son. And they sh the Holy Spirit revealed a portrait of the cross of Calvary. And I saw the nails that were in my Savior's hand, the one who shed his blood and died for me. And I thought, what other choice do I have but to bow down and to say, holy is the lamb glory to the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world for you and for me amen how many of you know god had jesus in mind all along he had the cross in mind all along it wasn't the backup plan because the old covenant didn't work out jesus was the plan all along and so i thank god that he looked way down the corridors of time and could see me coming and could see you coming and let his son die on the cross for a wretch such as I. I still can't wrap my brains around that. Anybody ever try to wrap your brain around that kind of love? I can't do it, but I receive it in the name of Jesus. Our scripture reading for today is found in the gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 5. The gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 5. And when you are there, I'm going to ask that you'll stand to your feet. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. And I'm just, we're just going to read one verse. I probably should, could have let you sit down because by the time you get up, uh, we'll be done reading. But if you stood up, it's all right. Stretch for a moment. Matthew chapter 5. We're just going to lift up one verse. Verse 9. I'm reading out of the New International Version. I'm glad to see everybody in this place today. Welcome. To those of you that are first time visitors, welcome. To those of you that are returning guests, welcome. We are delighted to have you in this place today. And to those that come every week, welcome, amen. God bless you. Matthew 5 verse 9 in the New International Version reads as follows. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. You actually can sit down if you would like, even in the presence of God. If you want to stand up, it's all right, but you can sit down. I'm good. Father, we thank you today for mercy, because we recognize that had it not been for your mercy and for your grace, we would still be lost. We would still be out there, and when I say out there, I mean outside of your will, living according to our own standard. If it had not been for your mercy and for your grace, we would still be on our way to hell. If it had not been for your mercy and, and your grace, so beautifully displayed on the cross, we would yet be your enemies. But I thank you, God. Uh, that you called us. I thank you, God, that you offered us a way of escape from the hand of the enemy. I thank you, God, that you offered us an opportunity to be in relationship with you, to be in relationship with you. I thank you that you offer that, and what a beautiful relationship it is. Nothing compares to what we have in you, God. Nothing compares to what we have in you. Nothing compares to what we have in you, God. And so I just want to say thank you, God, you could have left me out there you could have but you said I was valuable you said that to all of the human race you're saying that even today that you love us and that we're valuable to you and that you want to be in relationship with us and God when I look back over my life I know how unworthy I am when I look back over my 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 mess ups and my screw ups and the days that I blew it and the seasons that I blew it and yet you still called me I'm mystified by it so God, I bow before your majesty. 
I bow before your throne today, God. Glory to the Lamb. I bow before your majesty, and I say, God, have thine own way, God. Have thine own way in our lives today, God. Have thine own way in this place today, God. Have your way. Oh God, I pray as I always do. I pray that your word would go forth with clarity and with precision. I pray that your word would go forth in the way that perhaps it hasn't gone forth before, at least from this pulpit. I pray that your word would go forth and it would accomplish everything that you said that it would and it would not return unto you void. Whatever you've intended for it to happen, I pray that that would happen. God, I pray for listening ears, listening ears. I pray for receptive hearts. Hallelujah. Let the people on the other side of the camera have listening ears and receptive hearts. I pray that for the people on the inside of this building, listening ears and receptive hearts. But God, I truly pray. I pray for responsive lives. May we respond to your truth. May we not go week to week to week and say, it wasn't the word good, wasn't the songs good, didn't we have a time and there be no change in our lives. God, I, I, I'm going to go home if that's going to keep happening. But God, I pray that you would make a change in our lives. You start right here with your preacher. Make a change in our lives. That we're going to be better because you were better for us. That we're going to live according to your standard better than we did last week because you put it all on the line for us. God, help us to have listening ears receptive hearts, and responsive lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. If I were to give this a title, I would call it Agents of Peace. Agents of Peace. I want to tell you uh, and preachers, y'all know what I'm talking about when I get ready to say this. There are often times when we have things intended that we're going to talk about when we come before God's people, uh, the things that we're going to share about. But sometimes on a Saturday night, God begins to talk and he says, no, 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 no. You save that for another time. This is the word for today. You save that for another time. Um, and and, and I, I believe as preachers, and this is preachers across the board, teachers across the board, I believe we ought to speak to the moment, Okay. I mean, that we ought to speak to what's going on in the world today. We ought to speak to what we understand. That's why when we were in seminary, they used to teach us, keep your Bible beside your bedside, but keep a newspaper there too. Because if you look in the newspaper and you see what's going on in the world, that just might be the word that you need to speak to according to God's ordinance. And so God told me last night, no, you need to talk about how I've called you to be an agent of peace, how I've called the church to be agents of peace. Is that all right? If, if it's not, I'm going to go with it anyway, all right? I think you'll agree with me that this has been some kind of year. Everybody keeps saying, how much longer for 2020? As though 2021 is going to bring uh, something greater. And I'm not so sure about that. So I just want to stay in the moment sometimes and just hear what God has to say. This has been some kind of year. After doing our best to navigate through eight months of a very difficult pandemic, we come to the events of the past week. After enduring several months of a presidential campaign, the moment finally comes where we are called to exercise our constitutional right and cast our vote to help determine who will be the one to occupy the highest office in the land for the next four years. Every day, and I know y'all got them too, text message, phone call, over and over and over again. I think I got more calls to vote than I did about my car warranty. I'm just going to say it. You know, is your car warranty? I don't have a car. Can you stop calling me? Is your car warranty? Yeah, and I'm good with that. Can you stop calling me? And so you get all these car warranty calls. But I think the people that wanted you to vote outpaced the car warranty people. Amen. Don't worry. Tomorrow, you'll start your car warranty calls back again. Constant calls. And then the day finally comes for us to cast our vote. And when the polls finally close, those invested in the outcome of this election agonize for four very long days before finally learning who our next president will be. 
in the person of Mr. Joseph, and I learned Robinette Biden. If you paid attention at all yesterday, when the announcement came, you saw thousands of people dancing in the street all across the country celebrating his win. I think my favorite was the people in Philadelphia dancing to Ain't No Stopping Us Now. Uh, I think it was at the Brothers Johnson, but they, they were doing it, the electric slide and everything. There were thousands of people dancing in the street all over the country celebrating his win because for them, he represents an ability to finally exhale. For them, he represents a sense of normalcy. For them, he represents a path to equality. If you were on social media, you saw women all over the country, especially women of color, shedding tears, sharing their excitement about what is now possible for their daughters and their granddaughters because the glass ceiling had just broken. Those who favored the candidate who did not win. I do not like to use the word loser uh, because it has very negative connotations. And so I say the winner and the one who did not win. But those who favored the one who did not win claimed election fraud and went to great lengths to have their grievances heard uh, all the way to the point of bringing guns to polls and being arrested. That was not something that caught us by surprise, right? That was actually expected. There was a, a lot of that going on throughout the campaign. And so I expected there to be opposition. There was opposition when Hillary Clinton lost in 2016. And so you expect the one who doesn't win to bring forth opposition. But let me tell you something that I did not expect that grieved my heart. Can I just be honest here for a minute? Can we just come forth with it? Okay, what grieved my heart was to see people of faith, people who profess Christ, speaking in a way that is sure to divide the country further. That did something to me. I expect unbelievers to act up, but I don't expect people of faith, leaders in the community who lead churches, to come out in such a way such that the divide is so very apparent and is worse when they get done talking. Accusing supporters of the winner of untruths, painting all of them with a wide brush, even though there's great diversity amongst those who supported Mr. Biden. Mr. Biden's side pushing back against the accusations, just as hard as the accusations were coming, people of faith who were supported Mr. Biden were pushing back as well, deleting people on Facebook, blocking people, unfriending people, without ever really hearing what they have to say. This is the portrait of the church that the unbeliever was looking at on social media yesterday. I understand the celebration and I understand upsetness, but what I don't understand and what is very distressing to me is when people of faith get on there and help the division continue to go. That's the danger of social media. We live in a world today where nobody talks. And there's something very troubling about that. Nobody picks up the phone anymore and says, how you doing, sis? How you doing, brother? Everybody texts each other. And if you don't answer, good, I'm done with you. If I say something on social media and you put an emoji that doesn't quite line up with what I want, I'm done with you. That's the danger of social media. It's a great tool in some regards because we're on social media right now, so you can't bash it all the way. But there are some very breakdowns in communication that have come across because we now rely on social media. There are beatdowns that happens. There are misunderstandings that could be avoided if we simply picked up the phone and called each other and had face-to-face -face conversations. And all of this is happening in the world. All of this is happening while a world, Facebook has about five million people on it. All of this is happening while a world of unbelievers watch the church further disintegrate, this time over who should occupy the White House for the next four years. It grieves me. It grieves me. Does it grieve you at all? 
Does that grieve you? I know we're taught to just keep strolling, keep strolling, keep scrolling. And I understand that. And sometimes I do that. But every once in a while, in order for us to understand what's really going on, we have to actually look. In order for us to know what we need to be praying about, we have to actually look. In order for us, we don't have to respond, but we do have to know what it is that God has called us to do and what it doesn't look like. Sometimes if you're not sure what it looks like, it's all right to know what it doesn't look like. Am I right about it? I know I'm right about it. So all of this is going on all day yesterday, and I'm sure it's going on right now while we're talking. All of this was going on as a world of people who do not know Jesus watch the church further disintegrate, this time over who should be in the White House. And there were some people that tried to get through with statements like, God is still on the throne. Jesus remains King of kings and Lord of lords. But all of that was dismissed with the noise. All of that was dismissed because of the nonsense that was going on. I believe that it is for seasons like this that Jesus spoke about peace. It's for seasons like this that Jesus spoke out of the text that we have before us today. It's because of seasons like this that Jesus speaks to the believer and those who would dare to be his disciples about peace. In the text that is before us today, we find Jesus very early in his earthly ministry, he's been preaching and teaching in synagogues. He's been healing all manner of diseases, all while becoming an overnight sensation. The more power that Jesus demonstrates, the more attractive he is to people. And he begins to blow up and the crowd gets larger and larger and larger. And the larger the crowd becomes, the more difficult it is for Jesus to get the message to all of them. Finally, the crowd is so large that he has to go up on a hillside. He has to go up into a mountainous area where he begins a long discourse that speaks to the current condition of his people while promising them a future of hope. He speaks to the current condition of his people while promising them hope for the future. This passage of scripture is part of what we commonly refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. And this particular portion of scripture is what we often refer to as the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are that which Jesus has declared that help the believer understand what our attitude should be. Think about that when you think about Beatitudes. What our attitude should be if we belong to Jesus Christ. What's the attitude of the believer? Jesus tells us clearly throughout the entire Bible. He tells us what our attitude ought to be. God tells us in the Old Testament and then in the manifestation in the person of Jesus Christ. He speaks it in the New Testament. This particular passage of scripture speaks again to what the attitude of the believer should be. The seventh beatitude, if you count them, we're coming out of number seven. It's in verse nine and it's our focus for today. It says, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called the children of God. What does the word blessed mean? Blessed means happy or fortunate fortunate are the peacemakers for they will be called the children of God fortunate are those who live at peace with others for they shall be called the children of God fortunate are those who create opportunities for peace for they shall be called the children of God did you catch that other part not that we just live at peace with one another but we begin to create opportunities for peace between parties that where there would not be any peace you see I believe over and over and over again I know how hard 2020 has been and I've struggled with it as well I mean I have labored before the Lord over 2020 I know how hard it has been but if you just step back for a minute and not look at our own situation you'll see that God has given us opportunity after opportunity opportunity after opportunity in 2020 to be the light of Christ. He's given us opportunity after opportunity to share his truth with people. He's given us opportunity after opportunity to let people know that there is a bomb in Gilead. He's given us opportunity after opportunity to show people the cross of Calvary, that there is a fountain that's filled with blood that's drawn from Emmanuel's veins. He showed us opportunity after opportunity to tell people that Jesus himself put it all on the line just because he loved them opportunities 
that we have missed, opportunities that we have missed in our homes, opportunities that we have missed on our jobs. You don't have to be a preacher in a pulpit to catch the opportunity, opportunities that we have missed at the Giant Eagle, at the Shop and Save, and at the Walmart, opportunities that we have missed to bring the light of Christ into the conversation, opportunities. The world is in so much distress right now. The world is in so much distress right now. Yet the church has time to fight about who ought to occupy the White House. That should not be. That should not be. That should not be. I declare I will not be a part of that. And I hope you'll join me today that we're going to bring forth the light of Christ. We're going to be agents of peace. We're going to bring people to the table and that they might come to us a place of common ground. And then there's our opportunity to present Christ. 2020 has been rough. It's been awful. But every time God gives us an opportunity, but you have to get outside of your own pain for a minute. You have to get outside of our own circumstances for a minute. We have to get outside of the fact that we got to wear a mask and shop and say, we've got to get outside of that for a minute and recognize that God has given us opportunities. <laughs> Hallelujah. In this passage of scripture, chapter 5, verse 9, when you cross-reference, how many of you are studiers of the word of God? If you don't want to raise your hand, that's okay. If you don't, I don't want to know I'm not a studier. That's okay. That's okay. But if you're a studier of the word of God, amen, and I would encourage you if you're not a studier of the word of God to get to studying the word of God, amen. The Bible says that we ought to be workmen and work women that can rightly divide the word of truth, amen, that we should not be ashamed that we can rightly divide the truth of God's word from the false of God's word. And so if you're a study of the word of God, when you looked at Matthew 5 and 9, and I want you to do it tonight in case you didn't do it today because you didn't know what I was going to talk about, but I want you to do it tonight, okay? Matthew 5 and 9, you're going to look and you're going to see that there's a cross-reference scripture for it, amen? And the cross-reference scripture is still in Matthew 5, and it's verses 43 to 47. Now let me read it for you. And when, when a scripture cross-references each other, I'm going to give you a little, a little cheat study thing, it means that that next scripture supports the first scripture, amen, or will help illuminate the first scripture. So Matthew 5 and 9, when you cross-reference it, takes to Matthew 5, 43 to 47, which reads as follows. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your father in heaven. Same verbiage. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not the pagans or the unbelievers do that? And so when you run the cross-reference, it challenges us to go further into the word because we'll just gloss over the word if we're not studiers and go further. And so it talks about how we handle situations when people don't agree with us. It talks about how we deal with somebody who voted for the other candidate. It talks about how we handle situations where there is a disagreement, where people would dare to even say, we're their enemies. And that's what people are saying. If you're not on the Trump team, then you're an enemy. If you're not on the Biden team, then you're an enemy. Enemy, and these forces are coming together like they've never come before. There's all kind of angst going on like they've never come before. But again, we've been given the opportunity to present Christ. Last week, we talked about the seventh I am statement. We talked about the seventh I am statement. If you don't remember it or if you weren't here, I would suggest you go back and check it out. The seventh I am statement is I am the true vine. We touched lightly on the seven elements that make up the fruit of the spirit. And guess what? One of those seven elements is peace. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 lists the seven elements and one of them is peace. Peace is one of those elements that cannot be produced in our lives unless we have the indwelling presence of God's spirit. That's why it's called an element of the fruit of the spirit of God because it cannot happen in our lives unless we have the indwelling presence of God's spirit. If we are left to our own devices, how many of you know that we will have no peace with God? If we're left to our own devices and our own way of thinking, we will have no peace within. If we're left to our own way of thinking, we will never be able to live at peace with others. 
But thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. God has provided a way for all three of those to happen. How many of you know today that you can have the peace with God, that you can have peace within, and you can have peace with everybody else? Oh, come on, somebody. You can have peace with God. You can have peace within, and you can live peaceably with other men, regardless of whether or not you agree on everything. If left to our own devices, we'll put all of that aside. Thanks be to God because of the Lord Jesus Christ and the faith that we have placed in him, we can have all three of those. Well, let's talk about how you get peace with God because that's the first thing that has to happen. You can't foster peace between you and other people, especially people that don't think like you unless you have peace with God. Come on, somebody. I know I'm right about it. Amen. And, and there are many, 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 many people in this world today that have some system in their mind of what puts them at peace with God that is not Bible. So can I just go? there for a moment amen what does it mean to have peace with God well when you read Romans chapter 5 it speaks of the fact that as I said earlier that when we are outside of a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that we are enemies of God nobody wants to hear that but that's Bible that before we have yielded our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, if we have rejected the Lordship of Jesus Christ, we're on the outside of a relationship with God. And with God, it's very black and white. You're either a friend of God or we're enemies of God. Come on, somebody. I know I'm right about that. The Bible says that the only way that we can no longer be enemies with God and be at peace with God is if we bow to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's Bible. We can make up our own things if we want, but the Bible says there's only one way to have peace with God. We're born in sin and we're shaped in iniquity because of what happened at the Garden of Eden. But until we come to the place where Jesus Christ becomes the Lord of our house, of our life, we are yet enemies of God. But thank you, God. You've provided a way for me to be at peace, peace with you, and that's with Jesus Christ. God demonstrated his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Come on, you got to read Romans chapter 5. It says that while we were yet enemies of the cross, God demonstrated his love for us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And reconciliation is what brings the sinner to be at peace with God. I know I'm right about it. I know, I know it's tight, and preachers don't want to preach this kind of thing because they don't want people to take out running, but woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel. Woe unto me if I don't tell you that there is a way of escape from a life of sin. Woe unto me if I don't tell you how to be rescued from the hand of the enemy, not only because God loves you, but because I love you. Woe unto me if I don't tell you about it. Let's gloss it over. And let people go to hell because we didn't tell the gospel. I'm not willing that anyone should perish. I'm going to tell you a way of escape. Reconciliation is what brings the sinner to have peace with God. And the Bible says that once we have peace with God, the spirit of the living God begins to take up residence in us. How many of you know about the presence of God? How many of you know about the indwelling presence of God's spirit that walks with me and talks with me, that tells me that I belong to God? How many of you know about the indwelling presence of God that says, I love you more than anybody loves you. I'll never leave you and I'll I'll never forsake you. I'm a shelter in the time of storm. How many of you know about the indwelling presence of God? Oh, Jesus, thank you for that. And when we have the presence of God, when we have the indwelling presence of God, he begins to produce a fruit in us if he, we allow him to do it. If we allow him to prune us, like we talked about last week, the indwelling presence of God allows a fruit to be produced. And one of those elements of the fruit is the, is the element of peace. And when it's manifested in our lives, we get a peace within. A peace that surpasses all understanding. A peace that doesn't make sense. A peace that everybody else is trying to figure out what that's about. But when we have peace with God, we get the peace of God. Come on, somebody. When we have peace with God, we have the peace of God. And when I have the peace of God, I can then have peace with my fellow man. That's the way it works. We have to have peace with God. Peace of God. And then I can have peace with my fellow 
men, even those who would dare to disagree with us, and that's certainly their right, even those who would disagree with us, even those that are declared our enemies, we can live peaceably with. We don't have to subscribe to everything that they think, and they don't have to subscribe to everything we think, because we could be wrong about some things. But when we begin to build a bridge, and we begin to find common ground, and when we begin to have peace with each other, then we begin to understand each other a little bit better. And when we understand each other better, there's an avenue for dialogue about the Lord Jesus Christ. Opportunity. Even those who disagree with us, we can live peaceably with them. Proverbs 16 and 7, you'll find these words, when the Lord takes pleasure in anyone's way, he causes their enemies to make peace with them. You ever had that happen in your life where you knew somebody couldn't stand you, but Jesus said, I'm just going to keep my eye on the cross. I'm just going to keep my eye on Jesus. I'm going to keep my eye on what God has called me to do. And every time I see that person, I'm going to say good morning. Even if they don't say it back to me, I'm going to say good morning. How you doing, sister? How you doing, my brother? Is everything all right? And after a while, they're going to look at you like you're crazy. And over time, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. That thing begins to crack off of them. And they begin to say, well, tell me about this joy that you have. And you can say, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. And the world can't take it away. And you can begin to talk about the hope that lies within. We ought to be always willing to talk about the hope that lies within. Every once in a while, we've got to go the extra mile and begin to live peaceably with people who don't want to live peaceably with us so that we have an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It says when the Lord takes pleasure in our way, when the Lord takes pleasure in the way that we're bowing down before him, even though it hurts me, God, I'm going to speak to this sister. I know she's going to dog me, but I'm going to speak to this brother anyway, because I know my ways will please you. And eventually you're going to make this thing happen. Even when the Lord takes pleasure in your way, the Bible says he causes our enemies to make peace with us. Think about it. I love, there was one post that I read yesterday that caught my eye. I put all kind of hearts around because I loved it. It was a believer who was a Biden supporter. People think those two can't go together, but yeah, people who are believers are also Biden supporters. It was a believer who was a supporter of Joe Biden and he committed himself and put it on Facebook. He put himself out there. He committed himself to looking for common ground with every Trump supporter that he meets. It was powerful. And he started putting pictures of, of African Americans together with Caucasian people. There were all kind of pictures uh, on his Facebook post and he said, I'm committing myself starting today. And this was a staunch Biden supporter because I know him and he put it out there that I'm going to do everything I can to find common ground with every Trump supporter that I run into. That You have my word because it's in Facebook land and y'all know even when you try to get rid of a post, it's somewhere out there in cyberspace. People will find it and put it on there again. And so we put the commitment out there. You know why? Because that's what peacemakers do. That's what peacemakers do. They don't judge people by their posts. They don't judge people by tweets. They don't judge people by their texts because we never understand what people are going through. We never understand the context of what drives people until we actually have a face-to-face -face or a voice-to-voice -voice conversation with them. We don't understand the whole picture. I'm going to do whatever I can to find common ground because the nation has to heal. I'm going to do whatever I can to find common ground because the church has to be a light. Come on, somebody. I'm going to do whatever I can to find common ground because I want to live peaceably with all men because God told me that I have to. I mean, you don't need proof of anything. Just look in the word of God. God has called us to be change agents. God has called us to be peacemakers. God has called us to create opportunities for conversation. That's what peacemakers do. They look for common ground and they build from there. That's what peacemakers do. Believers must take the position of peace. Get on either side. Take the position of I don't know who you voted to, for and I don't need to. But our position has to be the position of peace. The Bible speaks about this over and over again. In Hebrew 12 and 14, the writer of the book of Hebrews says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone. That's what it says. 
make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. And then it says, out without holiness, no one can see the Lord. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. That's Hebrews 12 and 14 in Romans 12 and 18, Paul says, if it is possible, not get this, Romans 12 and 18, I want you to get this. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. As much as I can control, I ought to live at peace with everyone. I can control me. I can't control everybody else. As much as possible, let's live at peace with everyone. And that just doesn't mean every believer or everybody that looks like you or everybody thinks like me. Anita, as much as possible, as much as it depends on you, whatever you can control, live at peace with everyone. This is the word of God. Again. We're missing the opportunity. We're missing the golden opportunity to share Christ, to find common ground, to build on the common ground, and to ultimately have a relationship with someone that we didn't have before that we might share Christ. This country, I'm going to tell you, is never going to be right if we don't start having conversations. If we don't start having conversations, this country will never be right. If we don't start having conversations, this community, your community, wherever you live, is never going to be right. If we don't start making time to have conversations, I'm not talking about on Facebook and by way of text. If we don't make time to start having conversations, it will never be right. And it won't matter who sits in the White House. It won't matter. It won't matter because we have to do our part to be what God said we ought to be so that God can heal our land. We have to do our part. We can't wait for everybody else to do it. We can't bank on the right man being in the White House. We can't bank on the fact that the first woman is a vice president, although I delight in that. We cannot bank on that fixing things for us. We've got to pray. Peace, peaceable people pray. Peacemakers pray, but we've also got to be the agents of God's word. We've got to be the agents of God's peace that speak this thing into existence. Amen? Our country and our community, maybe even your house, ain't never going to be right. We start having conversations. You fighting with your children, teenage children, adult children, living in my house, really? You know, what do we say? Get the step in if you can't. Can we have a conversation? Can we have a conversation? I learned that after I did it wrong 10 times. I learned that, that when you start having a conversation, things shift because I'm willing to hear what you have to say. And and, and, and we're so much um, in our feelings that we want everybody to hear our truth, but we don't want to hear anything anybody else has to say. I know I'm going to have to run out the back door to the car after that one. But that's the truth, because I've seen it. Yes, I want to share my truth, but I also want to hear your perspective. How did you come to the place that you're at? And if we're willing to listen as much as we're willing to talk, we might get somewhere. We might get somewhere. But if we want to do all the talking, guess what? After a while, people are going to say, I don't want to hear that no more. Because you don't want to hear what they have to say. The country will never be right. Our community will never be right. Our homes will never be right until we start having conversations. Make an effort to have a conversation with people. Make an effort to talk to people, to understand people rather than dismiss them because the assumption is made that they are haters. Let the goal be that I want to hear you and understand you so that we can have common ground, even if it's only this big, and begin to build. We may not agree on everything. At the end of the conversation, you may still be this supporter and I may still be this supporter, but there's got to be some common ground on which we can share and begin to build and live peaceably with each other. Amen? Blessed are the peacemakers because peacemakers live at peace with others. 
Peacemakers make peace happen. Come on, somebody. They make peace happen. They forgive people because they know they've been forgiven much. Peacemakers recover peace where it has been broken. Peacemakers create opportunities for peace. And above all, they pray for peace. We have to do the work. We have to do the work. We have to. And if we can do this as a body of believers, I'm talking to people that have already submitted themselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. If we can do this, God is pleased. God is pleased. God will be glorified and our communities will become better places. God will see us operating as his agents of peace in a dying world that so desperately needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God says, blessed are those that do what I say. Blessed are those who are peacemakers because I'm going to confirm them in the end. I'm going to confirm that they're mine. I'm going to confirm that they are the children of God. I don't know about you. I'm looking for God to say, well done. When it's all said and done, I'm looking for God to say, well done. And not necessarily because I preach good or because I didn't preach good or what have you, but because in my day-to-day -day life, I was a representative for him. Amen. Everybody doesn't have titles, and we don't have to. The worker bees are the ones who are actually out there trying to do the work. Everybody doesn't have to have, to have a title other than child of God. And God will sanction us. But I want him to say, well done, because I want him to say that when she lived her life, once she knew better, she did better. Once she knew who I was and how much I loved her, she became an agent of peace for me. She became an agent so that the world could be impacted one person at a time. You don't got to speak to masses. You don't have to speak to 5,000 people. You don't have to do that. Maybe it's somebody you have lunch with on your job. You're, you guys are having a sandwich at the construction site. God is pleased when we found a way to live peaceably and an opportunity to share the gospel. Amen. I want you to think about that this week. I want you to think about that this week. God has called us to be his agents. And one of the things he's called us to bear is the element of peace. How can I do that? You know, I, it's always my prayer that when we leave this place, that we go home. And we begin to think about what is the application of this word in my life? What does this mean for me? How can I be an agent of peace? What could I do differently in the areas of my life where I am at and where I have some influence? What can I do differently that God would be pleased and that I honor God? And nobody has to know about it but you and God. I don't have to be publicized everywhere. But let me tell you something. God is pleased when we represent him. And guess what? He'll tell you right then. You ain't got to wait till the end. He'll tell you right then, I'm pleased with you, my son. I'm pleased with you, my daughter. And the joy of pleasing daddy, there's nothing like it. Would you agree? The joy of pleasing our heavenly father, there's nothing like it. I always think.